Do you really believe that eating a toke gecko is going to cure AIDS? Or that eating tiger penis, ground up rhino horn, or even drinking tiger bone wine is going to help your performance in the bedroom? These traditional myths and trends of magical and curative properties and powers are actually having a dramatic impact on wild animal populations. And if we don't change our perceptions and our attitudes to these beliefs, then the future for wildlife is looking grim. The increase in human population, as well as our consumption of natural resources, is one of the world's major threats to the world's animal and plant species. An illegal wildlife trade is ranked as the third largest illegal trade after drugs and arms trafficking, estimated to be worth in the billions of dollars. Now, we usually think of illegal wildlife trade to be related to ivory, tiger parts, or even rhino horn. But we really need to look beyond tigers and tusks, so to speak, beyond the charismatic species, the ones that target our hearts, because they are, in fact, so cute. These animals are all worthy of conserving, and I should know, having worked with them, like, you know, the orangutans and the pandas. But who are we to determine what is worthy and what is not? Are animals such as songbirds, pythons, or even the toke not worthy of our attention? Now, I was recently in Africa, actually only three weeks ago, hanging out with the mountain gorillas of Uganda and getting up close and personal with the elephants as well as the rhino horn in a savannah. But it really was to try and get a better handle of the situation at hand. And let me tell you, wildlife crime has gone rogue. Over 100 elephants are killed each and every day to, make, to meet the demand for ivory for the Asian market. And why, you ask? For status, power, and greed. But there is a much bigger picture unfolding here in Indonesia, actually right on our doorstep here in Bali, with animals being sold as exotic pets, food, and traditional medicine. Now, there is no surprise that habitat is quickly disappearing all around the world, and especially in Indonesia, in Sumatra and Kalimantan, to make way for the increasing production of palm oil. Now, whilst I was um, coming back home from Africa, I went to North Sumatra, as you do, to check out on a project site, and I was surrounded by palm oil, literally. Now, it's the ingredient we'd all love to hate, but unfortunately can't avoid, as it's found in most consumer products, such as shampoo, chips, and biscuits. But the development of these roads for these palm oil plantations is actually facilitating this trade, as it's making it so much easier for hunters and poachers to go deeper into one's remote jungle to set up their snares and their traps to capture one's elusive life, wildlife not available for sale. We perceive animals as commodities, and this is not a new concept. It's been around for millennia. But what has significantly changed is the scale and the scope of this trade. I, aside from an animal welfare issue, there's also a real issue with the impact that it has on biodiversity, as well as potential species loss forever. Now, I want to plant a seed of awareness to you today and tell you that our relationship with nature is completely strained and out of balance. And I wonder whether we as humans really are the pinnacle of evolutionary success. Because if that is so, then why are we so disconnected from nature and the riches that it brings? Well, an African ecologist by the name of Baba Diume actually sums it up quite well. He says that in the end, we will conserve only what we love and love only what we understand. And this is so true, because people are generally very fearful of what they don't know. It's our perceptions and our attitudes that actually influences the way we relate to each other, but also the way that we connect to the natural world. Now, I'm a conservation scientist, but I would much prefer referring to myself as a conservation change catalyst or a conservation change agent. And my mission today is to get you all back to nature. Nine years ago, I took a leap of faith and um, I had a wake-up call. I left my corporate career behind as a management consultant, left all my possessions and went off to the Amazon basin in Bolivia in South America, where I had my epiphany to rescue uh, wildlife from the illegal wildlife trade. And it was this puma, um, not really little, but she was two years old. She opened up my eyes and lit up my life and took me on a journey that I'm still on today. 
My day-to-day -day job, if you can even call it that, was to run with her and teach her everything her mum would have. So in my gumboots, with my machete in the hand, I ran with her to teach her everything her mum did. And her story is like so many others like her. Her mum had been poached and killed, and tequila was sold as a pet on the wildlife trade. The reality is that these animals are really cute when they're babies, especially when they're cubs. But they're wild animals. And at around six months of age, they're going to start to show their natural instincts. They're going to jump. They're going to uh, play hide and seek. They're going to stalk you. And that is often when the um, animal abuse occurs in the homes and when, pe when they're found in the pet trade. I have actually for nine years gone through conservation ups and downs, peaks and troughs. But it's led me to undertaking research with traders at wildlife markets to get an insight into their lives, into their perceptions and into their attitudes. Illegal wildlife trade is a multifaceted commerce continuum with a very complex supply chain from a harvester and poacher to the end consumer. But it's the traders who are ultimately the end suppliers to people like you and I who are driving this demand. As I walk through Pramukha, one of the largest live animal markets in Southeast Asia, actually in Jakarta, all I could see and smell was animals everywhere in this multi-level decrepit building. Birds, reptiles, mammals, you name it, everything is available for sale. You just need to ask. So if birds are not your cup of tea and you would prefer something a little bit more cute and cuddly, then how about a protected, critically endangered slow loris, or even better, a baby orangutan. I was about to interview one of these traders, um, but he was in the midst of completing a sale. The customer was after a greater flying fox, or a fruit bat, and at around 150,000 rupiah, which is around $15, it would make for a cheap pet, so I thought. I wasn't prepared for what I was about to witness. The trader took out one of these beautiful animals out of the cage, which was crammed with 20 or 30 of these beautiful fruit bats. Its wings were spread to show its two-meter wingspan, when suddenly, crack, the first snap of the wing, crack, the second snap of the wing, and all I could hear were the painful squeals of this living animal. Then it was folded in half, before being chopped up like sushi, chick, 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 put in a plastic bag, ready for consumption, all in the belief that it's magically going to cure asthma. These animal and wildlife interactions are actually a great way for wildlife disease transmission, such as bird flu and SARS. And with the recent Ebola epidemic that's rife in West Africa, which was initially related to the consumption of bushmeat, such as gorillas, chimpanzees and primates, this current epidemic has been directly linked to the consumption of fruit bat. This is a major global concern, and it's something we can't hide away from, as we just don't know when the next epidemic could be around the corner as people are eating raw animal parts. On my way back um, via um, North Sumatra, I was actually stunned at what I saw. In a five-kilometre span, I counted over 50 roadside stalls, each selling these fruit bats, with around 20 or so in them. Now, you do the calculations. That's 1,000 fruit bats in the span of five kilometers. So is there a major asthma problem in North Sumatra as to why we are over-harvesting these innocent animals? These wildlife markets, uh, as well as roadside stalls, are actually considered as wildlife sinks. They're, not, um, they're completely ignored and dismissed and don't make the international headlines. They're also excluded from... Um, the uh, international policies called CITES, the Convention of International Trade of Endangered Species of Fauna and Flora. And, you know, whilst this policy is great if we're looking at monitoring legal uh, international trade, it doesn't cover domestic illegal trade, which is happening underneath our noses on a day-to-day -day basis. And then there's the wastage. There are, for, there are so many animals that die during uh, transit from capture to market. For every live animal at the market, another three may have died en route. Now, based on my research, the average mortality rate for animals is one week. And that's for the more resilient of species, such as the toke or pythons. But when the wildlife delivery truck comes to a trader's door doorstep to replenish his stock, 
then a trader's perception actually is that there must be an infinite supply of wildlife and natural resources. The rarer the species, the higher the demand, the higher the price. There are also all these pop-up shops that just appear out of nowhere on the side of the roads, adjacent to shopping centres, with opportunistic traders selling anything they can hand get their hands on, there one day and gone the next. This conservation problem really is not just a matter of sticking to national or international rules and regulations. We really need to look at the motivational drivers as to why people are getting involved in this trade, because money and livelihood are actually not the main reasons, as we would expect. Demographic and socioeconomic factors, as well as cultural traditions and values, actually influence the way that we behave. And keeping exotic pets as a hobby is actually one of these examples. Bird keeping uh, is deeply and culturally entrenched in Indonesia, and especially in Java, where a caged bird symbolizes status and power. Bird singing competitions, or kecawan, uh, or bird idol, are actually one of the main reasons why people are buying these live songbirds to compete for that ultimate prize based on a bird's vocal capability. There's also um, been an increase in consumer demand for the toke gecko, as I mentioned before, with many um, people in China and Vietnam actually wanting th these animals in the view that it's going to cure AIDS. These urban myths, fads and trends are actually driving this demand, and unknowingly and unwittingly, you may all be indirectly contributing to this. Sure that you're not buying ivory or tiger parts, bear bile or even eating turtle. But who here owns a pair of python skin heels, a bag or a wallet, or even drunk kopi luwak? For those of you who don't know what kopi luwak is, it's actually uh, coffee beans excreted from the palm civet cat. So essentially, civet cat poo. Now, I personally don't understand the logic, but at $70 a kilo, you would want this coffee to be damn good because it's having a major impact on wild civet cat populations as people are hunting them down just to start their own backyard business. The illegal wildlife trade must be considered as an environmental, economic, as well as a social problem. We really need to shift the cultural beliefs of keeping and consuming wildlife, but also to reduce this demand and changing the public perception through education and awareness. Now, we are currently in the sixth wave of mass extinction, and never before has this happened at such an alarming rate. The last mass extinction actually occurred 65 million years ago in the age of the dinosaur, which happened naturally. But today's mass extinction is happening in our lifetime and on our watch. We live in a very digital, fast, accessible world that's full of gadgetry and we're constantly plugged in. But this actually impacts the way that we connect to nature as well as the way that we relate and interact with other living species. So I'd like to urge all of you to, to step outside and to open up your eyes and your ears and to see a world of wonder and diversity, sound and colour that is the essence of what keeps us alive. When you see the great Tuscus roaming the savannas of Africa, like I was privileged to see last month, as well as seeing the relationship between baby and mum orangutan as they swing from tree to tree, will it become so much clearer as to the value of these animals' life as opposed to dead? I have seen a very seedy side of this business, but I'm also very humbled by the um, traders who allowed me into their lives and who allowed me to see what they do, their perceptions and their attitudes. And I wonder whether if I had the opportunity to take them into the jungle and to let them experience and see the animals that they sell in their natural environment, could it be possible that it could change their perception? Valuing nature makes conservation relevant and approachable in all of our lives. Everything is connected in this intricate living web called biodiversity. And the truth is, is that the survival of every single one of these species is actually our only insurance to our own survival. Knowledge allows us to form opinions and then act on them. Because as Baba Dium says, only when we know and understand will we care. Thank you.